It is Tuesday, November 14th, 2017. My name is Ashton Ellett. I'm here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining us today is Mr. Guy Milner, uh, founder of the Norrell Corporation, uh, currently the CEO and chairman of Assure America Corporation. Assurance America Corporation, let me get that, let me get that right. Um, thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. Milner. Thank you, for, thank you for the interest in political history. You know, I came to Atlanta in 19, the fall of 1958, having graduated from Florida State. I worked my way through college selling cookware door to door. I had a team of 50 students that worked for me my last year in school. Go back to uh, an early childhood. My father was, had to drop out of high school in the eighth grade, had a small service station. I was fortunate to have two great parents with great values. And you know, uh, you, you're blessed in life if you have a good start. And I had a, I had a great start. My family were Democrats. Uh, I, I remember going to a couple of rallies that my parents took me to when I was 10 and 11 and 14 years old. And then at Florida State, uh, I became involved with the Young Democrats, became head of the Young Democrats of Florida State. When Adlai Stevenson, when Adlai Stevenson ran for president, uh, I introduced uh, uh, Adlai to, to about uh, 300 students at Florida State. Uh, I was chairman of his campaign. I had a picture <laughs> of Adlai in my room. It, it was from floor to ceiling and about eight feet wide. So I would wake up every morning <laughs> and look at that of, of all the, th uh, as, an exactly, Illinois, exactly. as an Illinoisan. This. But you know, I think we, we, we get involved with careers unbeknown to us sometimes from very early experiences. So I was the attorney general for the senior class in high school. I go on to college and I'm head of the Young Democrats. Uh, I go on to uh, uh, work with a person, uh, we were attempting to write a book on George Smathers while I was in Tallahassee. Uh, I, come to, I come to Atlanta, I get involved uh, in my business and building the company and so kind of dropped out of politics. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Lyndon Johnson came along and scared the daylights out of me <laughs> and Goldwater brought me into the Republican Party. So you, you mentioned you were attorney general. Where was the moment where a young man like you, it seemed like your path was law school or, or business. Was, was there ever a point where it was you were going to be a lawyer? It was pre-law at Florida State. And, and in fact, my major at Florida State was, get this, public administration <laughs> and pl slash political science. Sure. So when you go back to high school, when you go back into college, you see the early beginning of a policy interest, uh, uh, an interest in, in, in improving policy and involvement with the leadership in government. So it, it began way, way back. Uh, so it, it, it was business um, what drew you to Atlanta? I was interviewed by IBM and turned down. I was interviewed by Procter & Gamble and turned down. Uh, and as, as I go forward 30 years, IBM, I signed a $65 million contract with IBM that grew to 140. So uh, uh, it, they gave me the break. When, when I didn't get into the corporate world, mm -hmm. uh, a person who I'd met said, let's go to Atlanta and start a personnel agency. And I didn't know how to spell personnel but it sounded pretty good to me. And so I came to Atlanta. I was not married at the time. And uh, that was the opportunity of a lifetime. If, if you think about it, in the corporate world, you kind of stay in lockstep. And before you mm -hmm. know it, your sales, district, region, VP, headquarters, but you're kind of captured by that corporate entity. A very hierarchical uh, you world. Just, I mean, you're kind of in it and it's hard to get out and your spending goes up as your income goes up. Uh, I had a chance to be half owner of a business, and what an opportunity that was! It changed it changed the uh, trajectory of my life. Sure, for sure. sure. 
What was your assessment of Atlanta when you when you We you had there's down? a Darlington apartment sign down there and it said 250,000 people in Metro Atlanta. Metro, Metro Atlanta. Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> and today it's like six and a half million or thereabouts. So Atlanta's been, uh, Hartsfield was the mayor, mm -hmm. later came on to uh, Ivan Allen. Uh, we had a, uh, I, I was very involved with the Atlanta Chamber early on because I knew that to build my business I had to connect with people and, and so uh, I, I found that 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 involvement was very helpful. If you just if you could describe you know sort of the the I don't know necessarily the temperament the outlook the worldview of those those those, those chamber of commerce folks what what has come to be known as the business establishment here in Atlanta the people you were working with in the fifties and sixties. I don't know that I uh, have a definition on that question. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I think that what you have. We had a smaller community. Uh, the chamber had a magazine. They would write up success stories, and I was fortunate enough to be written up as, as one of the young men on the go, so I've to speak. Seen, I've seen it in the Atlanta in, in the Atlanta magazine. We, uh, I, I found that, and go go for fast forward to the, to the governor's race. Uh, if if in '94. Uh, I visited uh, uh, our, our detention centers, uh, uh, RDCs, I believe they're called regional detention centers, mm -hmm. where we have young people there. I mean, you really see what happens when a young person doesn't have a snowball's chance, uh, maybe because of lack of family support or whatever, or peer, peer, peer groups, that's the wrong choices, but then they get into one of these regional detention centers, and candidly, I'd see eight kids in a classroom, in a, in a small room called a classroom, and there might be, there might be uh, 12 kids and there might be eight books. There might be a child that is, is uh, 14 years old, and there's a child that's 18 years old. I, I mean, it, 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 it was just a holding, it was kind of a holding pattern. When you are involved in a statewide campaign, you get exposed to the opportunities even more so to, to find ways to serve. I, I, uh, I, I believe that we should have privatized those regional detention centers. I think that the, uh, the YMCA coming in as a partner to those could have done, could do, and could have done a much, much better job of, of, of rising, taking those young people to another level. You, you just, uh, so back in the chamber involvement and then later working uh, for my first campaign, I guess, was Bob Bell back in 1980. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, um, 82. 80, 80, yeah, and, and, and uh, Mac Mattingly was 1980. Right. And I traveled the state for Mac. We we uh, we pr I probably spent three months on the road with Mac, uh, eating a lot of fried chicken and barbecue <laughs> and staying at the Economy Six. Uh, I got to learn Georgia. I loved the candidate. I thought he was a, a, a fantastic person, and I believe Mac has been recognized as having served our state very very well. Before we, we, we really jump headfirst into politics, I'd like to talk about you know, your company that you already mentioned, Norell Corporation. You're, you're part o owner, part founder. Uh, why a, a personnel company, 1961, I believe, uh, thereabouts. Yes, right. Why that company? Why that time? Why Atlanta? We had, uh, number one, it was my skill set now because I'd been in a partnership after college for two years, I'd been in a partnership in which we were placing, placing college graduates. I worked with uh, the placement office at Georgia Tech. I worked at the placement office over at Georgia State. Our graduates who didn't go through the normal process of getting a career assignment, mm -hmm. we would connect with them and then with other national. So that was my base uh, level experience. And fortunately, my partner at the time didn't want to expand the business, and I, I did. So he bought my interest, 
uh, I took a few months to form another company in which mm -hmm. I was the primary shareholder. Uh, and we started, uh, the name of it was Southeastern Personnel. And uh, then we acquired a small uh, one-man shop called Norell, and then we called it South Norell Southeastern, and then we later dropped to Southeast because it had geographic limitations. We were in the permanent placement business, and I saw what Kelly and Manpower, those companies were doing in the staffing business. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I began a staffing company. I, I traveled uh, to various cities, uh, getting to know the owners of people in that business. I think if you get around folks that are doing something, you'll learn if you're smart and, and if you're inquisitive. Uh, and so uh, we started from, from scratch. And I believe uh, our first year we did it in 1969, we did a million dollars. In uh, 1986, we did uh, about $18 million. Uh, no, 69 to 76, we, we, we did about uh, $18 million. We set a five-year plan, what could we do in five years? Uh, we set a goal of 65 called Plan 81. We did 80 million plus. And it went on to uh, become a $1.4 billion enterprise. Keep in mind, this is a person who sticks with a job. <laughs> <laughs> it started in 61, and I sell the business in 99. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tell me about, we, we, met, we were t talking briefly off camera before we started rolling, about the transition from a, a heavily industrialized economy to one that is more service-oriented, office work, health care, things of that nature that require temporary staffing, permanent staffing, man, different sort of manpower uh, with, with differentiated skills. Walk me through how you were, were, were surveying sort of the, the lay of the American economy as a businessman. I'm not sure if it was a, a delay. I, 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 I would suggest to you that we used to think about uh, employers and employees and lifetime contracts. Oh, sure, almost. sure. Sears and Roebuck. In fact, my mother wanted me to go to work for Sears and Roebuck because she said they have a good retirement program and you're guaranteed a job. I said, Mom, thank you, but <laughs> no, I don't think I want to do that. And thank goodness uh, uh, I, I uh, didn't go down that path. <laughs> but you could see uh, supplemental staffing. You could see the need for people when a person was out on vacation, uh, they needed a replacement. And so, again, Kelly and Manpower began, began in the uh, mid to late 80s, I mean, uh, mid to late 40s. So those two organizations, when I started in temporary staffing, Kelly was doing 50, 50 million a year. Wow. And we were doing zero. Uh, and when we sold the business in 99, we were a billion four and Kelly was uh, four billion. So that gives you a little sense of the fact, we almost call it with him, not, not exactly, but uh, there, was a, there was a tipping point. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal, and I want to say this came out in 77, 78, maybe 1980 timeframe. And, and it was a back page editorial on the tipping point, and it talked about supplemental staffing. And it says once you get something to where it's 15% uh, utilization, once it reaches 15% of where people, they buy cameras or they buy, they sign on to Amazon or they, in other words, when you reach a 15% critical mass, you're at a tipping point to where it, it's going to grow significantly. You could see that in staffing. And then Jimmy Carter, our governor, who I introduced, by the way, in 1974 to a national convention here in Atlanta, <laughs> uh, he, he was elected and was part of the movement to take minimum wages from, I think it was a dollar, and then he took it to a dollar and a half, and then he took it to 175, and then to two and a quarter. In other words, it, it moved up over those four years very, mm -hmm. very rapidly. That helped the temporary help industry, the temporary staffing industry. Because if you think about it, our market is pegged on 
an hourly rate. So when the hourly rate was going up at the lower end that quickly, it meant that our markup grew. And so that was part of the, that was part of the supplemental staffing side of things. I think if you look at the whole world of industrial distribution centers, what sure. we're seeing today, uh, you saw that back then and it was a growing phenomena. Uh, I, I really, uh, we didn't have much in the way of uh, exposure to the manufacturing side. That was more Midwest, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mid-America, uh, more the industrial. The Southeast, Atlanta particularly, uh, Nashville, Birmingham, that's where we opened branch offices. Okay. They were, uh, they were insurance, uh, retail, uh, it wasn't a great deal of manufacturing, candidly, uh, uh, warehousing and distribution. As it is today. So. And growing quickly, quickly, quickly. So you, you mentioned um, you know, Lyndon Johnson, Barry Goldwater, so that sort of you know, great society election. How did you get involved? Did you get involved in the Goldwater campaign? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, but John Kennedy, uh, I voted for him and, and, and I... I loved his. It's on uh, the record now. I loved his. I loved his. Uh, I loved his uh, style and his his politics. I think the. I think the uh, reducing the corporate tax, which helps businesses to grow more. I'm a great fan the of 62 that. The sixty-two tax cut. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was a big. It was a big momentum back then. Uh, uh, his his assassination was uh, just a horrible thing, and then Lyndon came in with a great society. And, and frankly, I've always I've always had a strong belief in, in in working. I believe my grandkids. I tell them all the time, "Hey, go, you know, get a job during the summer." I've had some interns over at our insurance company. I pay them ten bucks an hour. They don't get rich over there as an intern. And I tell their boss, "Make sure they work. If they don't work, fire them. You've got the right to fire them if they're not on time doing their job." So I've been fortunate to have kids that have been over there, and uh, I, you, you know, it's it's we we help people so much with the Great Society, the welfare programs, and then Clinton came along with Newt Gingrich, and uh, said you're going to have to work for that, and that was a great that was a great message. That was a great message. So you weren't involved in the Goldwater campaign. No, I was raising a family. Every, and building a business. Three kids, building a business. I really wasn't in, uh, Jimmy Carter, when he was elected governor in 70, in 1972, he, he served. Uh, uh, and uh, we, the, we lived at the time uh, cl close to the governor's mansion. And so uh, I, I invited uh, uh, the, the young girl, who's now <laughs> his daughter. Amy. Amy. She, she was, you know, this big. My kids were that big. So she came over to our place and would trick-or-treat there. Okay. So a state patrolman is following <laughs> along the roads as they're going trick-or-treating. Uh, we, we took the Carters, they were new to the governor's mansion, they were new to the neighborhood mm -hmm. there in Buckhead. We took them out to uh, fireworks uh, uh, up in North Atlanta, and so they had a chance to be part of the July 4th presentation. We come back to the governor's mansion, I go with Jimmy Carter into the kitchen, uh, he's, getting, he's eating boiled eggs, he likes hard boiled eggs. <laughs> and. Uh, and I asked him, I said, well, you know, t tell me a little bit about, I mean, you know, what are you thinking? He was thinking then about running for president. This might have been 72 or 73. Mm -hmm. And he went on to tell me that Hubert Humphrey, who would stay at the, who, would, who was the nominee the previous time, and would stay at, at, he would stay overnight at the governor's mansion. He said, well, if Humphrey can run, I can run, <laughs> and sure enough, uh, Jody Jody Powell and that group Ham Ham uh, Ham uh, Jordan called me. Uh, I I introduced Carter to the uh, 
to a group of about 500 of the National Association of Employment Services. Mm -hmm. the convention was mm -hmm. here in Atlanta. I said, you may be soon to hear from the next president of the United States. <laughs> this is 1974. <laughs> Governor Jimmy Carter. He stepped up, gave a great talk. That's a Saturday night, right? Monday morning, Jordan's calling me, saying I need the zip codes and the phone numbers and all, all this stuff. They were so they were so on top of that game. I got to give Carter a lot of credit. And I'm in Chicago, sitting in one of these diners where you have the you know the the use where I mean you're sitting here, but really somebody's pretty close here and somebody's pretty close here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm hearing several people talk. This was after one of the uh, debates, and several people said, "You know, Carter's going to Carter's going to win this. Carter's going to win." I keep Carter, 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 Carter. Uh, I came back and I told the folks here in Atlanta, uh, "This guy may be your next president." So, you know, you're eating eggs with Jimmy Carter, and but what leads you to the Georgia Republican Party? Um, no, no. Paul Coverdale and I were, and Nancy, his wife, uh, we were, we would meet at my office over in, in this, this would be 75, 76, 77. We would bring people in to get on the phone to call regarding what we had the 120 club back then, which was people gave $10 a month, 120 a year. And so we we're trying to build the 120 club. And Paul Coverdale is, over here in this office on the phone. Nancy's down here. We probably have four or five other people involved. So I got, I got involved very early on with the Republican effort to, to build a conservative base here in the state. What was your assessment of sort of the, the party infrastructure, the state of the party, when, when you think of it as an organization? We, we were limited. Uh, we were not uh, viewed. Uh, we were aspiring. <laughs> we were working hard, uh, but, but this was a democratic state. This is a big democratic state. So you, you, you come on board in 1980 uh, on Mac Mattingly's campaign. Tell me about your, your experience. As you already said, you, you sort of traveled the state you know, raising money for, for Mac Mattingly and helping him in that campaign. What do you remember about that 80 campaign of, of, of Mac Mattingly? Uh, I, I remember uh, traveling in a lot of small communities, I can tell you that. Uh, I, I recall that Mac, uh, I, I mean, it was all about fundraising. And, and my job as, as chief fundraiser was to, to, to see what I could do to, to uh, get some results for that, for that, uh, for that effort. Uh, I, I don't recall any strategic meetings that were held that were memorable. I just think Mac was everywhere, lots of energy, lots of smiles and, and happy faces. And when he beat Talmadge that night, uh, it, 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 it was a big deal for Georgia. That was a, that was a big player that was brought down. It, it's been about 50-50 um, with the people I sit down and talk to who are involved in that campaign. 50% thought Mac Mattingly was going to win, about 50% never thought he had a chance. Right, right. Did you think he could win? You always think your candidate can win. You sort of have to. You, well, <laughs> but you also are, you lose objectivity because you're kind of in a bubble and you're listening to a lot of people that are, have the same sort of feelings and attitudes, and you know, so yeah, you 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 expect your person to win. It might be an upset, but you expect your person to win. How important was was Ronald Reagan um, being in the White House from from eighty one to to, to eighty nine? How important was Ronald Reagan that figure at the top of the ticket to well, think, building the party? I think it here? was huge. I met him once. Uh, I think I think it was I think it was huge. I think his first couple of years he struggled, uh, but uh, and 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 if there was there was some reason in '86 uh, during the campaign, the Senate race of '86, 
that, uh, that the, the Republicans were held hostage. Uh, they, they couldn't get out and campaign. And so we would hold fundraisers here for Mac, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he would be on the speakerphone but but couldn't be couldn't be there because they were holding people hostage. They had to be there to vote, which is understandable. And they'd save these votes in some of these states, knowing that you couldn't get the candidate. And so Weich is out there campaigning like crazy. And uh, so that was that was a disappointing loss. Do you think that? that that was a surprise loss. Right, right. And what I was gonna, what I was gonna ask about '86 is, is, do you think that that you know the tactics of the Democrats were the only reason that that Mac lost that race, or do you think he he, he tried? Was there anything strategically he could have done differently? That I don't know. Had? I don't know. I tell you, elections about waves. Truly, truly. Uh, I will tell you that in 94, when I was running against Sal Miller, I got closer in that race than I deserved to get. I'm, I'm a neophyte, a new guy on the block, never been in politics except behind the scenes. And here's a guy that's been in politics for 18 years, lieutenant governor, and then... and then Before uh, that, really. Oh, sure, right. So it, it's... Uh, it, it, it's, it, it, Newt told me uh, and told a group of us about six weeks, four to six weeks before the 94 elections okay. that, uh, that we were going to get within five or six or seven seats of control of the House. We we're going to get that close. Man, that was exciting. And then about three weeks out, he said, you know, we're within about three seats of getting control of the House. And a week before that election, he told a group of us over in Cobb County at a, at a local meeting place, he said, we're going to win the House. That wave, that wave just... Uh, so in my election in 94, I got 49%, 48.9% of the vote, and Zell got... 51% of the vote, uh, 32,000 votes were the difference. Uh, that wave took me that, that close. The wave in 98 was the exact opposite. It was a huge Democratic wave. Uh, and so you just have to live with those waves uh, one way or the other. Well, speaking of... Uh, I don't know if it was necessarily a wave election in 82, but there was definitely an anti-Reagan anti backlash in 82, um, and you were finance chair for Bob Bell. Right, right. Uh, tell, tell me about Bob Bell. Tell me about Bob, Bob Bell, Bell's campaign. Bob Bell was a great guy. Betty, they, they're a great couple. Uh, I occasionally see him still today. And, and uh, Bob, uh, Bob and I met... Uh, I'd, I'd helped Mac Mattingly, and so I was two years off. He knew that I knew some of the contacts around the state. And uh, he said he wanted to run against Joe Frank Harris. And so I said, well, I'd be glad to help you however I can. Bob Bell was a hard campaigner, a smart guy. He would have been a good governor. The one experience that I take out of that campaign is that I go out to Peachtree DeKalb Airport for a for a campaign event that we've got down in South Georgia. I pass by the Waffle House, get a cup of coffee. I'm out at the airport at like six o'clock or a quarter till. Uh, Bob and Betty are there. It's a small little plane that's been given to the campaign for that day to use. It's a, uh, an experienced professional airline pilot. <laughs> and so we get into this little plane. I'm sitting in the co-pilot seat and Bob and Betty are right here, and the pilot gears it up and starts to go ahead, and the plane's not moving. The plane's not moving. So <laughs> he says, oh, he said, would you get out and untie the... the so <laughs> the tail thing had been tied to a, a, a place where they keep, keep the planes from blowing away, I guess. Anyway, so I get out, and that was my, that was my first clue, right? <laughs> so now we take off 
and we're going to clear side, clear, clear sky, beautiful morning. We get over Macon and it's a cloud cover, total cloud cover, fog in South Georgia, essentially. So we're going to land in Thomasville and we're coming down, coming down, coming down. We get to about 300 feet and you can't get below 300 or you shouldn't because you could hit pine trees or, sure. you know, whatever. So the, he says, we got to go to another airport. So he goes to another airport. Uh, now the, the, the fuel is getting pretty low because he didn't fill it up because he didn't want to take his money to fill it up. He wanted to use the campaign money where we were to fill it up. So we now come down and now we're, we're coming across the, the shortest runway you've ever seen and the widest. It's 5,000 wide and about 200 feet long because we're coming across it crossways. <laughs> and the fuel is out like this. And he goes back up into the fog. I said, what in the world are we doing? Why don't we find, turn this plane around or something? <laughs> so we now have to bring it down. And we come down, come down, come down, break out of the fog, and we're over a pine thicket as far as you can see, keep flying a little bit and there's a pasture and we land that plane in that pasture. <laughs> I, I've got my head down, Bob and Betty are back there, they got the head down. So the pilot and I roll up our pants legs, this is mud, it's been a lot of mud in, in, in the field, been rain, and we get to the highway and a guy comes by in his pickup truck with his gun rack and, and, and over the back window and uh, we're flagging him down. We need a ride, right? We got to tell somebody we got a plane down here. And, and, and he rolls down the window and we say, sir, can you give us a ride to, to town? He said, our plane just went down. He said, are you, are you the boys that have been buzzing my cows? I said, no, we didn't know we were buzzing cows. He said, well, I had 50 head of cattle in that field about 15 minutes ago. So if you think about if those cows had been there, I may not be here talking with you today. Oh. That was a memorable experience. I was, I was getting ready to say, it, it's amazing the, the things you can remember, every intimate oh, yeah. detail. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I figured you were co-pilot. You were eventually just going to grab the stick and land it yourself. I, no, <laughs> no. So, so what did you just you stay in the background politically? Uh, during the 80s, just continued trying to you know, fundraise and, and, and do things like that. Uh, uh, help, help Mac again in 86, mm -hmm. uh, help Paul Coverdale uh, uh, in his race. Uh, uh, Paul had, I want to say, three runoffs or four in one, in one race. <laughs> and, and I took about three months off to help Paul and we raised PAC money. Uh, because it was a Senate race that was real important. Uh, and so, yeah, I got to know Paul and uh, Nancy very, very well. Since, since Senator Coverdell's obviously passed on, no longer with us, tell me, tell me a little bit about your, your memories about him, your memories of him as sort of a political operative and an elected official. Well, I went to uh, visit Paul uh, when when I was uh, uh, when I was running for governor in '94 uh, to get his advice and counsel and see what his thoughts were, uh, asking why he had run for the Senate as opposed to you know the the governorship, uh, his view was that the Senate was dealing with rural and the governorship was local and more operational. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm more of, a, of an operator. Uh, you can tell by the business background that, that uh, I like to build things. I like to improve on things. I like to, uh, I like, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious, so I'm always looking at how can we do it better. Uh, that's an operator skill. Uh, I'm, 
probably would have served the state of Georgia better as a governor than as a senator because I'd be impatient with the process. <laughs> Uh, I can't, I can't control, imagine why. <laughs> I can't control that. I can't control that, but I can control more things here in the state. What compelled you to, to leave the business world and enter the world of party politics, elected politics? I think you have to uh, examine, uh, or at least I look at it this way, I think you need to live your life with no regrets. So if you look at my history of high school, the attorney general, college, the head of the young Democrats, helping these candidates along the way, if you look at that history, I, I was always involved in policy uh, issues. I was interested in policy issues. So it was a natural interest of mine to, it, it, and, and so I would shadow these other candidates, and I'm sure in the back of my mind, the thought was, well, if I'm out there one day, I'll have the experience of what they've learned. Just like uh, uh, Purdue shadowed me in the governor's race. He was, uh, he was a governor. I mean, he was a Democrat, and he changed to Republicans. We're talking about Sonny Purdue. Sonny. Okay. And, and uh, so Sonny was helpful in my campaign. Uh, he, he was there because he wanted to have a feel for a broader sense of what the state was, was doing. And Sonny did a great job. Uh, Nathan's done a great job. Uh, so we've been very fortunate to have leadership in the Republican Party. David Perdue is doing a great job. So you've got a, you've got to, uh, we've got a deep bench. And, and when, when you say what got me involved, it was really kind of in my genes from from early on. And then when the business, uh, we, we were uh, probably the fifth largest in our business uh, in the country. Uh, you reach a level of success that, uh, uh, and, and this was always there, and, and Zell was running for, you know, his second term. Uh, we, 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 it just seemed like the right thing for me to do. I asked a, a former governor, I said, I'm thinking about running against Zell, and what do you think? And he said, well, he said, I can tell you this, you're going to get beat, <laughs> and your reputation is going to be cut in half. And I said, well, my reputation isn't that strong to begin with, so <laughs> I can't afford that haircut. But, uh, but, but it, was, it, it was a great experience. It was. You, you've mentioned um, briefly how you know, your experience in the business world helped you. Um, what was the hardest part about transitioning into, into politics, into campaigning? I have, a, uh, I, I have an English sense of humor, I've been told. Okay. Uh, I'm too, uh, I'm too patrician. Okay. I've been told. Uh, I guess you'd say button down, however you want to describe it. And so one of my biggest challenges was uh, 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 being viewed as, I mean, one, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the neighbors, one of the community, one of the people, uh, they, they, uh, and, and and it wasn't their fault in seeing me. It's it, it's it, it's uh, you know we all have a di all have a different nature. Sure. You got a nature. You would have a hard time coming across as a uh, nuclear scientist. I would. Guilty but, as charged. But you could come across very very successfully. In business, or in sports, or in politics, uh, you, you could fill a lot of what people would think about. In the, but so, so the challenges I had was uh, get getting re, doing a better job of relating to to the to the voter. They uh, oftentimes. Although getting 49% of the vote, I guess you'd have to say I did pretty decently. But I just wasn't, I wasn't a natural campaigner. I went down to South Georgia. We're doing a film. 
uh, and they want they got all this John Deere tractor stuff, right? Sure. And I'm going to be there with the John Deere tractor guy, and I'm going to be talking about farm issues. That's that that was the ad that we were preparing, statewide ad. Uh, you know what what are my views on agriculture? And so we got a setting, South Georgia, with the John Deere big, big equipment, and there's about six people from the from the community that are supportive of me, who, who are there. They're, they're, they're farmers, they're farmers. I'm dressed in khaki pants and a shirt, blue shirt, rolled up sleeve, so no, no fancy jacket or anything. <laughs> and and uh, there's a couple of guys that are joining us and I'm shaking their hands and I say, do you, do you uh, are you a farmer or do you work for a living? <laughs> As in my other circle of friends, are you, a, are you a lawyer like these folks, or do you really do real work, or a stockbroker? You know, it, it it's it's a joke. It's it's being it's being friendly and and trying to be real. And uh, so that that afternoon, there's a radio ad that Zell runs. <laughs> Milner fast. thinks Milner thinks farmers don't work, <laughs> and man, it was just it, so. How naive was that, right? Uh, I, I'm over at University of Georgia, your school, and the red and the black. What's it called? It, they have the student newspaper, red what's and black. Red and black. Mm -hmm. So the guy calls me. He's interviewing me. He says, "Hey, you know, where do you see this election being won?" And I said, well, it's not going to be one in, in Vidalia. It's going to be one in Metro Atlanta, where we have the largest population. Man, that hit the TV. And people in Vidalia, uh, man, this guy, you know, stupid mistake. The truth of the matter is, you're not going to win it in Vidalia because Metro Atlanta was too big. Gwinnett, sure. Cobb, DeKalb. I mean, it's just it's just too big. So you're red and black. Get me in. <laughs> Be before my time. And don't edit before that piece. My time. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what I'm interested in, in, you know, as you mentioned in, in the general election campaign, you know, you've mentioned it was always said, you know, political newcomer, and obviously you had been around politics. You had you had worked with candidates. You you knew the process. But how was as a first time candidate? Were you able to win the the Republican primary when you were running against people like Paul Hurd, who was you know, House Minority Leader, John Knox, who ran for everything? Uh, how were you able to 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 you know, rise above that crowd to win the nomination as a first time candidate? Uh, I guess it's <laughs> I guess you would say uh, perseverance and. Uh, uh, being uh, being maybe tougher than the next guy, uh, uh, I I would not let people uh, you know take over the stage. Uh, I, I wouldn't let them dominate and move me aside. So I guess the keep in mind I worked my way through college selling cookware door to door. I was trained by one of the world's greatest sales trainers, Zig Ziglar. He, he's, he's written books and spoke all sure, over the world sure. before he passed away. He was my sales manager. So I got, uh, I got a lot of don't take rejection, keep it in there. Uh, no, you're not gonna make a sale every time, but you, uh, you keep making calls and you'll make one out of seven. So every sale is 1 15th. Every call is 1 15th of a sale. So it, it's, uh, and and I I I have to say that my business background gave me a head start over the others. There were things that I had an appreciation of the government. I I, I ran on a premise that we could take seven cents out of every dollar of expense in government. Um, had a film that showed the nickel and the two pennies, and uh, I'd, uh, either people didn't believe it or it didn't grab hold, or maybe we didn't run it often enough, but. Uh, but I believe that I could have made the state much more efficient than, than we were. You, you've and it goes back to the operator's 
style. I'm, 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 I'm more of a manager than a uh, uh, policy wonk. Well, inter interesting segue because you know you're you know you have those two years between ninety four and ninety six. Why did you jump into the to the Senate campaign? I mean, Johnny Isaacson, who who had been uh, the the governor, the gubernatorial it's a great candidate. Great question. In 90. It's a great question. And here would be my answer. Uh, I've just come off a two year two years. I mean, a campaign mm -hmm. uh, now a year old, uh, and and we've got a Senate race. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, the. Uh, the name recognition that we've had, uh, the the funds that were spent in television ads, uh, there was a, a high approval rating of, of me among the Republicans. The way that I had run the race, and hadn't dis hadn't uh, hadn't hadn't disgraced anybody, or you know, put the party in a bad light. Mm -hmm. I went to. Uh, uh, I, I, I visited with Sam Nunn, and I asked Sam, I said, Sam, tell me about what you do up here. <laughs> tell me about, tell me about the, uh, the role of a Senate. Uh, I ran for governor, and uh, looking at, so g give me a sense of what, of what you see as that role, and how does it differ from a governor's role? And, and he went on to say that the governor's role is much more local and more, and the Senate, you're really dealing with world and national issues and policies. Uh, I, I, I felt comfortable in that. Uh, I, I would have probably, perhaps more than likely, been a one-term governor because I had Tom Murphy and I had a bunch of people and and man, they would have, they would have made it hard for me to work my way through the halls in the state capitol. I I, I I would have been challenged there. They would have known I was there because there'd have been a lot of stuff that would have been different. But it would have been a tough reelection because because of the newness of me to 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 running a business, the state, <laughs> uh, and all of the movements within that. A Senate position is is uh, is you you're not operating. You're really making a judgment on policies and and voting what you think is best for the American people. Uh, I, I would have sold our home. I would have moved to Washington. I would have kept a small place here, but I'd be there because I don't want to. I don't want to commute Monday and Friday. I mean that's. That's a tough life. Jack Kingston did it. Uh, Johnny did it to to a large extent, and uh, I saw Johnny just four weeks ago at the YCEO golf tournament, and uh, he's uh, uh, he's he served us very very well. Uh, my, my my position against Johnny at that time was that he was too much of a middle of the rotor, mm -hmm. and I was more uh, I, I was more the uh, the group now that they, 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 what do you call them in the Senate? The, uh, they're, they're fighting the establishment. You know, they're, they're, uh, I was probably more the Ted, uh, of the Ted Cruz uh, style. Uh, maybe some Ron Paul in terms of government spending. Uh, I, I would have probably been more there. Sounds like you were you were ahead of your time in terms of where the where the Republican Party was. I mean, obviously, you won the primary. Well, I don't know that I was ahead of my time. Uh, I I don't think I was ahead of my time. I uh, I think I ran against a triple amputee uh, who wouldn't appear on a stage with me. And this uh, is Max Cleland. Max, he wouldn't appear on the stage. Uh, I accepted. Meeting after meeting, Georgia public, Georgia Chamber of Commerce groups that, uh, and his rule was, if you're going to have him and us together, I'm not going to be there. Is what he would, and that's unfortunate because we could have debated some issues, and I think have got some clarity. But uh, when you 
when you and I feel so sorry for Max. I feel, I feel. Uh, I mean, ha in fact, I had to really isolate his condition somewhat. And maybe it was good that he didn't appear to m with me because a person that's lost an arm and two legs. Y you know, I had people after people in courthouses say, you know, I'd like to vote for you, but I got to vote for Max. Uh, and and so. That race was, you know, close, but but uh, I think it was 49, 51 or something like that. So it, it was closer than I probably could have, should have gotten to a person, veteran, triple amputee, a tough situation to run against. And they could run negative ads against me, and there was nothing I could say negative about him. Uh, now, when when he won and then served six years, mm -hmm. they had a voting record. And so uh, uh, our friend from the uh, Macon area, uh, Saxby, Saxby would, 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 uh, could run ads uh, about how Max had voted because he was pretty much a rubber stamp for the Democratic uh, Party. And so Saxby had a, that, that's how Saxby won, because he couldn't run against Max, but he could run against his votes. Do you think, do you think Georgians, many Georgians, cast ballots for Max Cleland, expecting him to be another Sam Nunn in that? I don't know. A much more centrist or independent I don't Democrat? Know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll tell you a humorous story on Sam. So uh, this is after the... Uh, this is after the Senate race, and they've asked me to introduce Sam. This is at a downtown hotel. There's about 150 people in attendance, and Sam is the spokesperson. He's, he's their guest speaker. And they've asked me would I introduce him, which kind of brings some little interest to it, I guess. Uh, so I go down, and so I'm introducing Sam, and I said, uh, I, I made a Freudian slip. I said, it's, I'm very proud to introduce to you our senior citizen, <laughs> our senior senator from Georgia for the U.S. Senate. And so when Sam got up, he said, well, guy, just, just to make a note, uh, I'm younger than you are. <laughs> so, so after 96, uh, I mean, you, you've ran two hard primaries to hard general elections. Did you ever expect to run statewide office again after 96? I didn't know. I hadn't, I hadn't really dwelled on it. I had not dwelled on it. Uh, I did, uh, you know, you look and say, well, you got 49% of the vote. I mean, you're getting, a, you know, you're doing pretty well out there with the customer, just not winning. Mm -hmm. Some reasons why you didn't win. And now we've got pretty open race. Barnes doesn't, Barnes doesn't have a, uh, any reason to think that he's got a big following. Uh, so, but the wave was going the other way. And uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a person that stays with things. If I believe in them, I stay with things. So are you going to quit after two failures? I mean, you know, three times a charm? Uh, be, be perseverance. Keep in keep in mind that uh, it's not a loss. It, it's really a series of lessons, and apply those lessons and become better the next time around. It it it, it so it was. In, in my view, it should have been a campaign I would win, but I got beat by eight points. I mean, it was a. It and it wasn't Barnes and it wasn't me. It, it was the way. <laughs> across the whole country. The, the sort of, I guess, that was the election. There was sort of a, a backlash against Washington, Republicans up in Washington. I guess. And it, it sort of trickled I guess. down. I guess. Do you, and maybe, maybe this is a personal question, do you think you would have jumped in the race had, had the revelations about Mike Bowers and, and his personal relationships, did that affect your decision to jump into the primary? No. It didn't? No, no. In fact, I'd already announced when that surfaced. Okay. 
during during your different campaigns, how closely did you work with the the Georgia Republican Party? Was there much coordination between your campaign and sort of the the party over there in Atlanta, the, the chairman, the executive director? Well, Billy Lovett got me. He, he was the one. On, he was heading up the party in '94, and he's the one that made the appeal uh, for me to run. Uh, and I was flattered by it and had been thinking about it. And uh, frankly, uh, I, I, I went to the governor's conference uh, down in, down in uh, Mobile, uh, where you had the Southern, Southern Governors Association meeting. I then spent uh, a day with Martinez, governor of Florida. I spent a day uh, with uh, Carol Campbell, South Carolina, mm -hmm. I called up Carol and said, could I come up and, and uh, this was in the 94 campaign and I spent a day with Jim Martin up in North Carolina, uh, just trying to get an understanding of their role as a governor and, and what, where do they find them spending their time and, you know, just getting comfortable. In other words, it, is this a sport I can play in? <laughs> you want to think about it that way. Sure. So, so, you know, I had examined it to my way of thinking, uh, and and uh, it 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 it's politics to change the subject just slightly. Politics is a is a business like any other business, and there's some fundamentals that you got to be sure that you have that you have together. Uh, your party structure will will uh, it is important to you, real important to you. But I don't know that I was particularly uh, working hard on behalf of the party uh, as much as working hard on behalf as a Republican for the office. There was not much coordination. The, uh, the party was, frankly, the party was still back then pretty weak. Uh, Newt was our, uh, you know, he was our kingmaker, so to speak, uh, and uh, was very helpful in giving me advice. Told me I need to go down in South Georgia and hang out with that crowd more. Uh, and I was doing that, maybe not as effectively as I would have liked, but, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but I don't think there was a closeness in the party, no. I'm sure there's not a close, there wasn't a close working relationship okay. between the campaign and the party. You know, reflecting on, on, on your three statewide campaigns, very expensive campaigns to run, labor intensive, what do you think your role or your influence in sort of building the Republican Party or building the Republican brand here in Georgia was? I suspect it was a tipping point. I suspect uh, 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 having having run those races and two out of the three uh, doing you know a decent job of getting folks showing up. Uh, I suspect that at the same time that there was a slow uh, change in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there was a. Uh, I think there was a change in the Democratic Party, and I think the more conservative movement was no different here than in other parts of the country. So those, those elections, those three elections, uh, were kind of a forerunner of, of what you might think, although it didn't develop in 98. Sure, sure. Uh, it, it, it then showed itself in 02. Uh, and and and, and every after. every campaign after that, right? Why do you think you were able to? You know, if you go and look at the maps, you know the red and blue maps with the different counties. Before Guy Milner's running for statewide office, Republicans are not winning rural counties in, in, in the in South Georgia, in Middle Georgia, in North Georgia. They're an Atlanta party, maybe maybe the suburbs here and. Columbia County right. or, or, or 
uh, Brian, Chad. Well, I don't think know. the Democrat Party was really a closet Republican group in those in many of those areas, South Georgia and 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 to the uh, up in the North Georgia. I mean. You had candidates that, that, in fact, they switched parties. You know, Nathan, Nathan, Nathan switched parties. Uh, Purdue switched parties. I mean, so I think, I think it was really uh, the, the Democratic Party changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the Republican Party changed. They, they, just, they just saw the light. <laughs> <laughs> The red and black may not like that comment, but I think they saw the light. Well, that gets me to my, my, my next question. It's just, why, is, why was, that is, the Democratic Party able to hold on to power in Georgia for so, for so long? Reconstruction through the early 2000s. Uh, I think you had people in office that weren't, they weren't the uh, the gray society crowd. I, I think you had uh, elected officials, Democrats, who, uh, frankly, govern in a pretty conservative, conservative way. Um, give me some examples, like like Joe Frank Harris or or George Busby. Well, or? I would say yeah. I mean, absolutely. Uh, I, I I I think of Sam Nunn. I mean, Sam's not Sam's not in the liberal category. <laughs> He may be a Democrat, but now he's, he, he um, many will be liberal on social issues. And then, but what's happened, I think, and this is a, this is a key takeaway uh, for you, perhaps, is that I think the social issues that were at the forefront in the early 90s, mid and late 90s, have abated and early 2000 into the teens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, the, the uh, sanctity of life is less of a litmus test. Uh, the, uh, uh, the test is, do, do you want to have a giveaway for people as opposed to helping people get on their own feet? Do you want to have a welfare program that constantly uh, feeds the, the, uh, the, in, the enabling to, to not step up, so to speak? So e economic or ideology on economics predominates what you know, we called the culture wars back in the I think 1990s. So. Yeah, I think so. I think we had the social issues. We had the Gay rights issues. I mean, I mean, it, it was, it, it, it was, it, it was, it was a strong litmus test uh, for candidates. And and uh, today, it's it, it's more the economic side of things that steer a person. Do you think this is a question I, I asked Governor Barnes? Is are there any Georgia Democrats left? I mean, obviously Sam Nunn is still with us, uh, but are there, if you think of elected officials in Georgia, the, any that fit that Georgia Democrat mold where they're, they're centrist, moderate, maybe conservative on economics, socially liberal, if they don't exist, can they get elected in Georgia? That's a great question. I'd have to think about that one. Uh, I'd have to think about that one. Can, can a person that is uh, liberal on social issues and conservative on economic issues get elected? And I think the answer would be yes. I can't give you a, uh, I can't give you an example. Uh, I can't give you a top of mind example sure. of that. What are the, if you think about the, the Republican Party of Georgia, so the state party, I mean, sort of set aside Washington, what's going on in Washington. What are the top priorities of the Republican Party here in Georgia? 
I would think that they need to, <laughs> today. You're talking about sure, uh, 2017. Sure. sure. I think they're almost broke, and I believe that they've got to uh, find ways to to build a structure, a Republican Party structure that will not only take a message, but will have the economics to to uh, you know. It's interesting. The party apparatus for the Democrats, and I don't know it, I can only have observed it, uh, and whether it's accurate observation or not, I can't tell you, but it looks as if they are very, very good in getting out the vote. Very, very good in, in, in getting out the vote. Now, how good are they in uh, messaging uh, from on high? I, I, I don't know, and I don't know you don't find a leadership standing out, frankly, in either party. You find candidates, uh, but but I think I, I I I believe today the bench for the Republican Party, nationally and state by state, is so much stronger, so much stronger. Uh, I mean, I just think that that's why we've got 32 or 33 state houses. Mm -hmm. Maybe one less than from last week, but I mean, generally speaking, uh, that's why uh, that's why we we've got projected to have the House and the Senate uh, in in eighteen because there's so many Democrats that are running versus Republicans. We got a whole lot more. I think there's twelve vulnerable Democrats and six Republicans in the Senate. Mm -hmm. So you you've got unlikely change change there. The, uh, the Tea Party, of which I would have been a part of had I been in the Senate in that 96 race. I would have probably been a part of that. Because my style is this. My style is this. If you got a problem with the VA administration and you look at w what the claims were and people waiting, uh, I want to go to a hospital and I want to go unannounced and I want to walk around. I, I want to find out what's really happening behind the scenes. I want to talk to some head nurses. I want to talk to the department head over this department. I, I, and then I'll eventually get to the head person. But before I get there, I found out a lot. Uh, our people that we elect, they don't do that. They, they, they're looking at stuff. And they're looking at material and they're looking at research. And they're, I mean, Walk. You've heard of walk around management. Mm -hmm. Who was most famous for that? Ooh, now you're putting me on the spot. Sam Walton. Yeah. Walmart. Sam Walton would yeah. stand by the cash register in, in one of his first stores, and the people are checking out, saying we don't have enough red ribbon to the cashier, and he'd make a little note. Of, I mean, he he was walking those aisles, listening. Our our, our political elected people. I told Weich Fowler, this is on a Delta flight, we're both back in coach from Washington to Atlanta. I just happened to be sitting across the aisle from him, just by accident. How that happened, God <laughs> only knows. And so he's, he's doing a statewide review of, of Medi Medicaid. Medicaid. Yep. Okay, I've got offices here in the state at the time, these were staffing offices that provided Medicaid helpers to go make home care visits. The government paid me. For every dollar I spent on expense, they paid me a dollar ten. So if I if I got more expense to a dollar fifty, they paid me a dollar sixty five. They paid ten percent over whatever my costs were, and that encouraged me to get big cost. And I didn't like that part of it. I, I didn't like that part of it at all. And I told Weich, I said, Weich, if you want to find out about the cost system, Come sit in one of my branches. You're welcome to do that. And come look at a set of books in that branch. Look at its P&L. See where its expenses are. See where the money's going. He said, oh, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Gave me my card. Call me. Never heard. They don't... It, it, it's a different... How did I... How was I uh, able to build a company with... with uh, a billion plus in revenue, you got to do a lot of listening. You've got to uh, have a lot of high level of curiosity. You can't take stuff as it's given to you. 
you got to probe and probe and probe. Uh, these folks that we get a, that are elected are they're not skilled that way. <laughs> I had a uh, Trent Lott came to campaign with me in that Senate race, and uh, when he heard about my background and we visited on the ride over to to uh, Brunswick, he said, "Man, I I need you in the U.S. Senate because." We don't have any business people there. We don't have any business people there, which is, you know, it's interesting. I mean, even take as good as Johnny has done. He's in real estate, sure. So he's doing deals, but it's not operating. It's not. It's not in the operations of a, of an entity. Government is big business. When you've got. How many veteran hosp uh, veteran hospitals, uh, uh, VA uh, around the country, and all the issues that we've had there? Uh, leadership after leadership failing them. You, you, you know, you just wonder. Get some of these guys out of the halls of there. And go down into that VA hospital over in Augusta. Walk around a little bit, because I can tell you this. That hospital and what's happening there is no different than the other 200 or 300 around the country. As I'm sitting here, no different. As I'm sitting here listening to you, you know, the, the issues you're bringing up, the way you're talking, uh, you sound a lot like Ross Perot in 1992. Yeah. That, this was essentially Ross Perot's message, which was what was his old saying? If you've got a snake, don't create a committee on snakes, just kill the snake. Yeah, right. You, yeah, right. you sound a lot like Ross Perot, which well, who I, came from a similar background. I take that as a compliment. I was at his birthday party in Dallas, no, no Texas. Kidding. Yeah, got to know him pretty well. He very, he's a one of a kind, one of a kind. I tell you, running for office, you do have the opportunity to connect with so many people. Kay Bailey Hutchison from over there. Mm -hmm. I sat next to her during his birthday party, and and uh, but John McCain came to campaign for me. George H came to campaign for me. George W came to campaign for me. Uh, uh, Trent, uh, I mean, you, I mean, you just meet a lot of people. You meet a lot of people. Do you think Don, Don Nichols? You know Don, that name? Uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, right? Don had me sit in the Senate caucus. Uh, because I was, I guess at the time, leading in the polls against Max, and he takes me into the Senate caucus, and he said, this is our next senator from Georgia. And I was able to sit there with him and, and uh, observe what that caucus meeting is all about. When, when I talk to folks or you read the newspapers about what the, what the Republican Party stands for in Georgia or what Georgia politics, the number one priority is always economic growth, economic growth. What is your assessment of how government is helping economic growth here in Georgia and how politics, government may be restraining or hurting economic growth here in the state? Well, for one thing, you don't want to end up with the North Carolina law uh, for 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 bathroom issues, uh, uh, and I think Nathan has done a great great job of of, of a balance balance and, and and you know bring some good judgment to how to handle certain things. Mm -hmm. You'll always have that uh, element that I want to get draw attention to something and make it a big focal point, and it will perhaps help them get attention, but it doesn't help state. Like, like the religious liberty bill or well, something, something yeah. of that nature. Yeah, I mean, you just have to be, you have to serve a larger cause. And, uh, but, but I think that if, if you look at uh, a more, more efficient government, if you look at a lower tax uh, environment for the state, if you then understand that growth for growth's sake is not what you want to achieve if you have a gridlock on traffic. <laughs> I drove but, over from Athens. I can well, I, tell I you can, all about it. I, I, can, I can promise you that uh, uh, there's, there's the, uh, 
the state that you want, the state of Georgia that you would like to see is a state that has a high quality of life. It's really an, it, it's an easy and a nice place to live. You can live where you work or close to it, which it saves a lot. It saves transportation costs, saves time, uh, uh, helps families. <laughs> You're not leaving your house at 4.30 to get to 8 o'clock job. Right. So, and then transportation, getting people where they need to, to, uh, to be, uh, it, it's, it's, that's, that's where a, a, uh, a Republican uh, or, or, or a Democrat in the governor's office uh, should be focusing their time. That's where they need to be focusing their time. If, if, you have a, if you have one of these wild issues that are taking you off a track, it's, uh, it's not healthy. I will tell you that we've got rural areas here that desperately need development. And we've got areas like Buckhead and North Midtown, Buckhead and North Atlanta that are getting crunched because there's so much concrete being being laid and high rises being sure. built and sure. not enough garage space, not enough parking space. Uh, two thirds of Atlanta, city of Atlanta, city limits, two thirds, is pretty much uh, vacant land. Really? Yeah. E examine it. <laughs> it's all it's all in Midtown North. And and so you have uneven growth. Oh, hugely unequal growth. Uh, the next mayor of Atlanta is going to need to be focusing on growth uh, on the south side of our city, mm -hmm. southeast mm -hmm. and southwest. Lots of land, lots of low utilization, close to the airport, all kinds of benefits. And then if you look at the logistics. Uh, uh, we, we, we've got a new uh, truck expressway coming in from Macon, as you're aware of. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're stopping right now at Henry County, but you're going to have, I mean, the port is getting so busy, it's going to be probably the third largest, or third busiest. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Savannah. Savannah. Right, Savannah. Uh, that, that's going to bode well for, for the south side development in terms of... Uh, uh, jobs uh, and logistics and the things that need to be close to there, but but uh, but we need to. You ever travel to Albany? And you ever travel to? Uh, oh golly, uh, Perry. Mm -hmm. uh, if you travel to towns of that size. You'll you'll see a a very sad situation of uh, lack of employment opportunities because since the mid '90s everybody's wanted to come to the big cities. So the, that's, that's been a trend for the the two Georgias. Oh, it's huge! It's huge. Had I been elected governor, I was going to take some of our state offices and move them out. Uh, there's no reason that the motor vehicle department needs to be in downtown Atlanta. <laughs> it could be in it, it could be in Brunswick or Albany or Thomasville. Because with technology today, I don't have to be there. I mean, and, and I've got lower cost of land. I, I've got probably payroll that is less uh, 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 lower cost of payroll. Uh, and I'm bringing opportunities to our state, and I'm freeing up downtown Atlanta <laughs> and some of that mm -hmm. for who knows how it might be used. But, but, uh, but I would have moved a lot of the departments out of metro Atlanta. It would have been disrupted to our employment base, and they would have had to move or else find other work. But it would have been a great benefit to the taxpayers. The Republican Party, you know, for, for most of most of your life, was was always the opposition party here in Georgia. 
Uh, but very quickly, very rapidly, it became the majority party after 2002. It has been ever since. What do you think the, the, the danger or, or the, um, you know, what is the factor that is most imperiling the Republican Party as a majority governing party here in the state? I guess if you take it for granted, your success, if you don't work on it every day to, to improve your status uh, and improve the, the reason that you exist, you've got to realize what your reason to exist is. And, and uh, again, I go back. The party apparatus uh, doesn't anoint someone here. Um, People who run for office essentially self-anoint. <laughs> uh, I might have been asked by Billy Lovett to run, but there wasn't a committee of 12 that I went before to, to make my case. It was, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was based upon uh, capacity and abilities. And if you take... Uh, if you take an upcoming governor's race, you've mm -hmm. got Casey has a certain capacity and experience. Uh, you've got uh, Hunter Hill on the other side. He's got less experience. Sure. Uh, less, le less of what Casey has in the way of experience. Uh, and, and, and who, 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 uh, uh, who thrives in that environment is going to be the one that can make their, their case. It won't be the party selecting it. I don't know if it's not the same for Democrats, candidly. I think uh, strong people figure out how to get to the top, and the party comes along with them. <laughs> 2016, a, a historic... We're good. We're good? Yeah. Okay. Maybe 30 minutes. Oh, oh yeah, we're, we're good. So 2016, a historic presidential election, un, a, a very surprising um, election. How was Donald Trump, of all people, able to sort of win the no, not only win the nomination, but become president of the United States? Well, one thing, he was one voice against 14 others. And so he splintered all their votes. Splintered all their vote. Uh, if you'd have had six candidates in the race, it might have been a different outcome. Who knows? Uh, secondly, I guess you'd have to say that Obama uh, created a uh, Uh, let me see how to say this. It, it, it created a, uh, a, he wasn't responsive to this, uh, the more conservative element in our country. Okay. He wasn't responsive. Uh, he didn't, he, he didn't relate to them. Uh, he, uh, uh, the, the uh, health care issue uh, was uh, an issue that the opposition to him took grab hold of mm -hmm. and made that a, a, a boogeyman that people, you know, would get, get worked up about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think it was a flawed policy. I certainly know, I mean, I, I certainly have always believed that. But the... Uh, I, 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 I think that the, there was uh, a little bit too much of the California, New York uh, elitists coming out of his, of his administration. And Trump uh, was rough and tumble. Uh, and he saw no downside to uh, being a, a way outlier. <laughs> saw no sound downside to that. 
I think Trump's attitude was, you know, win it or forget about it. But it's either one or the other. I'm not going to be milk toast and get get I, halfway there. I, I don't think anybody could accuse him of being milk toast. Right, <laughs> right. On anything. So, and and Jeb Bush was a poor candidate, very poor candidate, in the sense that he 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 wasn't transparent and he wasn't. He was soft spoken. Uh, versus George W. was more the cowboy and in your face. Uh, our senator uh, from Florida was the junior senator was uh, was Marco, Marco was probably viewed as too young. Uh, Christie was easy meat for Trump. I mean, they could beat up on each other, and and Christie was. I mean, I just think it was Trump handled that campaign very, very, very well, and and he got the nomination by by just getting everybody separated, uh, and then you move into the general election, and we know what happened there with with uh, Hillary just thinking it was a cakewalk. I, I was listening to the, this is last week, um, NPR had a piece, and they were talking to, to Eric Cantor, who was the, the former House Majority yeah, Virginia. Whip Virginia. up in Virginia, right. lost his seat to a, to a Tea Party conservative. Right. Um, and he, what he said was that essentially Donald Trump, he, he lost the popular vote, but was able to cobble together enough votes in, in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, that it was really just a one-off, that this was sort of a, a one-off election, and that the Republican Party was not really... I don't really believe that for a minute. What, what he was, and, and then there was an, op, an opposing person who said that, that the Republican Party is being remade into a populist, nationalist, anti-free trade, anti-global right. Uh, right. party, which when I think of the Republican Party that I remember growing up with, with, with George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush even, which was free trade... Uh, yeah. International cooperation. Yeah, but you know what's NATO. happened though. You you have you do have a carve out of of, of the economic system. You got an absolute carve out. What what do you mean by that? Well, you got no middle jobs. Okay. <laughs> you got no middle jobs. Uh, now, how do you stop that? I mean, you know, the question might be, how do you stop it? But I can, but I will. Uh, uh, I, 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 I'm certain that. Our policies allowed uh, a, a large part of our industry to go offshore, and and that was a terrific loss to us, terrific loss. So what you have is you have jobs going offshore. Those that are left are, are in the, these levels. They're either here or they're here. Uh, so the supervisor and the superintendent and the, the plant manager and, and all these sorts of, of, of career steps that people can move forward on, uh, they, 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 they've, been, they've been carved out. There's not much in the way of middle management today. Uh, like uh, technology takes the place of an awful lot. You've got... Uh, You've got plants here that are operated with one person mm -hmm. because it's going robotics. I, I, I'll tell you something that I think is uh, maybe uh, <laughs> you might not want to include this in your video, but you have a, we're going to have minimum guaranteed income because the jobs that are at the lower end are getting, are, are getting replaced by technology. It's going to do a better job. It's going to be a better job, and it's going to be quicker, and it's going to cost a lot less. So we, we're going to have a, a Bernie-type system. There are going to be some people. You could say today, well, we have it with Social Security and Medicaid, Medicare. We've got food stamps. We've got a lot. Sure. Earned so, income tax credit. So some of that, if not all of it, but some of that will go away. And there will be, I don't know, $42,000 for everybody. And, and, and 
sort of the the Scandinavian model. You're going to have that uh, with, with with this carve out. Uh, and with the advances of technology, you, you, you're just going to have it. And, and so we're going to have to make it a good thing instead of a bad thing. Uh, this, the professional and services sectors, um, I go to a trainer this morning at 7.30. You know, a li- you know a little something about this sector of the economy. Well, yeah, listen, <laughs> I go to a trainer and, and at 7.30. Uh, you know, she's, she's probably earning about 60 60,000 a year. Uh, I go to her twice a week. She's got a full list of clients. Uh, I mean, that, that sector is going to, the personal service sector, uh, the, uh, uh, the technology uh, 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 Programming and, and systems analysis, that sort of, that, that area is going to grow huge. Healthcare is going to grow huge. We all know that. Uh, but but there's, there's going to be a lot of jobs out there that, that are just not going to be there. If you, look at, if you look at what Amazon has done to retail, oh, sure. you're going to sure. have industry after industry doing the same thing to their little ones. It's the big fish eat the little fish. <laughs> well, I mean, I remember growing up you know, junior high, high school when a Barnes and Noble would move to town, all the little bookstores would close. And now all the Barnes and Nobles and, and Borders, they close because they can't compete with Amazon. Right. Um, and now Amazon's opening up bookstores. R- exactly. Brick, <laughs> brick and mortar. Um, so you, if I'm hearing you correctly, you are not a, a believer of when somebody says, we're going to bring back the factories, we're going to reopen the coal mines. No. You don't believe that's actually going no. to happen. No. That, there, that there's going, that no. was the old economy and we're going to build a new economy. Yeah. I think it left because of politics, but it's not coming back because of politics. I think it's, I think it's, it's automation. It's, 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 it's the reality. You, you, but the good news is, the good news is that there's some jobs, think about this for a moment, mm-hmm. there's some jobs nobody deserves to have. No one should have, said another way. They're redundant. They, you learn nothing. You're doing nothing interesting. It's a bolt and a thief, bolt and a thief. Okay, take that job away. Take that job away. Do it with a robot, mm-hmm. and find something else that that person could do that might add something to their life. Back when we were uh, marketing our our staffing, uh, we um, IBM had five thousand people, and they asked us to take those five thousand people. We created a subsidiary in which they were part owners. And our job was to bring productivity improvement to those people. In many cases, to facilitate early retirement. Uh, we, they, they were not market, they, they, they were not at market value. They, they had people that were out of market. And, and it wasn't core to IBM, it, it, it was a help desk job that anybody really could do with limited training, but they'd gotten after 10 years the same benefits as the scientists over here had gotten, different level of pay, but the same benefit increases, sure. and they'd gotten out of market. So we had many uh, people doing, on a temporary basis, you might take that job for six weeks. You might take that job for six weeks. Okay. You don't want to take it for life. A job, not a career. Right, right. What, what role then uh, does education play um, in this whole it's huge. transformation it's process? It's huge, it's huge. And uh, when I was running uh, for office, I wanted to take our university systems and put uh, a, a uh, have you ever thought about vocational education my parents uh, taught at community college level. Okay, well, stay here career. for a minute. Stay here for a minute. So, so why don't we have vocational education offerings at our university campuses? Instead of a, an entirely separate w- system. Why, why, why not? 
No, we, we do. It's called a school of nursing. It's on the campus. It is? Yeah. But we have these other things that are off campus in a community college. Mm -hmm. So bring logistics, the School of Logistics, onto the University of Georgia campus. Br bring uh, the uh, School of uh, 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 Data Analysis or uh, Technology, whatever, on, onto the so that every parent can say, my child is going to University of Georgia or my child is going to Georgia State, or my child is going to Kennesaw. And it may be in a vocational career mm -hmm. versus a science, but they are not second class. That, there, that there, there's a prestige level of going to the University of Georgia as opposed to- You would hear over and over again, I'm not having my child go to VOED, I want them to go to the university. Uh, if, it's a, if, if it's a badge of, you know, my child's as smart as any other child. Sure. We, we, they, it's such a horrible message, it's such a horrible message. And today, it's, you have the school of nursing, and at some point, I don't know how long it'll be, they're gonna wake up to the fact that you could have other schools on the campus. Instead of graduating all these social science candidates that have a hard time getting a job. In many cases, sure. Uh, so you, you think that the not just the the, the, the issue of prestige, but you, at a <coughs> pocketbook level, there's there's economies of scale that you don't you, you know you wouldn't have redundant you know support staff and something like that if if they were all centralized in say say a Georgia Tech, a Georgia well, Southern. Well, you have land limitations, space limitations, but. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much savings on synergy, but the mm. savings would be that you would be developing people who could go into the jobs that we need today. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't need a philosophy major today as much as I need someone who can can run a a uh, data center and and with a thousand servers or you know whatever it might. Uh, it, it, it's just, we, we're not educating the, our people for the, <coughs> we're not educating people, our people for the, for the jobs that we have, mm -hmm. that we have needs of. We're educating people for many jobs that they'll struggle, you know, finding, finding something in their, in their career. Not, not to say anything of the, the, the history of PhD job market. Well, I don't know anything about that. I'd have to ask you. <laughs> Horror stories. Um, you got a PhD? I do. Fantastic. In what course group? What? I am, uh, here, let me go ahead and pause it. You know, the, the, uh, one of the things that you hear a lot about in, in, in Georgia in our elections is the minority vote. Uh, and the fact that uh, George W. got 10%, George H. got 10%, I got 10%. I mean, it's kind of like a 10%. 90% goes somewhere else. You, you can only get 10% of that vote. So the, there's two theories. Uh, I heard them both. And I followed one. And it was very revealing. So in, in, in 94, there was, uh, there was, I mean, I did the normal outreach, but nothing, nothing, uh, Nothing significant. In fact, I was told that if 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 you're not careful when you when, when you try to capture the African American vote as a Republican, it gets their defenses really revved up, and it can come back to haunt you. And so I accepted that as a line of reasoning. I'm a new candidate. I accepted that as a line of reasoning. I did some campaigning in the churches, in the African American churches, in the white churches, and across the state. Uh, so I had that experience, and I got about 10% of the vote. Go, go forward to the 98 race, go forward to the 98 race, and I decided these experts that told me don't spend any time there were mistaken. So I'm going to spend time there. I'm, I'm going to and invest money there. I probably put uh, five to ten percent of our campaign resources there, 
and had been zero before, kind of. It was my time, but no resources. Okay. I hired people, hired people to get the vote out. We had a, a distribution of pamphlets. Uh, we had special radio into the African American community. Uh, I, I, I spent uh, probably half a million dollars on that just that just single initiative in '98. Got less percent of the African American vote in '98 than I got in '94. It's very, it's very interesting, very telling to me. Uh, even, even, even today, uh, and, and, and I believe that's going to change. I believe you're going to see, with the economy, with the economic development within the African American community, I think you're going to see more and more recognition of the conservative values of the Republican Party. I think it's going to be viewed by the African Americans. Uh, this idea that don't vote for them because they are only for the rich people or whatever, uh, I think it's going to slowly but surely go to the wayside. I, I, I see the day where we'll, we'll probably maybe get 30% of that vote. I know in this Atlanta mayor's race, uh, Mary Norwood is polling about 30, 35 percent of the African American vote. A white lady mm -hmm. from the north side of town. So uh, I think that's going to happen. Uh, but <laughs> there's my example. They said, "Don't do it." I decided to do it because I wanted. The, I wanted my wife and I, Jenny and I, would be in two African American churches every Sunday, every Sunday, one at nine o'clock and then one at eleven thirty. Uh, I, I can sing hallelujah with the best of them. And we, were, we were in those midst. We would be called up to the pulpit. Pastor would put his arms around us. You know, this is a good person. We got to be open to helping everybody. That was the message. Truth of the matter is, it got them so riled up, got them so angry about my reaching there that, man, they doubled the efforts to... to uh, to get their vote out. You, do you think that, that Donald Trump at the top of the, the ticket is sort of the face of the Republican Party? Um, as we, He's very brash. Outspoken is, is, is sort of an understatement. Do you think that's a temporary hiccup or a speed bump in minority and ethnic outreach that eventually, moving beyond Donald Trump, the Republican Party itself might begin to grow in those those communities, those constituencies? I think that his effort to get into the urban uh, blight issues, and and it's 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 sad, and and as we as you would certainly be aware of, and we got some urban areas that are just I mean they're 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 boarded up and there's mm -hmm. nothing happening except crime and drugs and whatever. Uh, he hasn't had a chance to get into those areas. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where uh, Carson, Ben Carson is. Uh, I don't see him much out there uh, and I'm not sure why. It must be a style issue, I guess. Perhaps he's doing a lot behind the scenes. But, but we haven't heard anything about that. I think Trump has the capacity to do more there than, than, than any of those candidates because he's pretty rough and tumble. Uh, and he, he, he has worked in a construction environment. He knows that environment. It may have been several years back, but he understands it. Uh, I, I, I think he would have a, uh, an opportunity to reach that person that, a Jeb Bush wouldn't have, or a Marco Rubio wouldn't have. Mentioning you know, urban issues, urban renewal, urban blight, you know, it made me think, is there a, sort of a mirror image of, of the, the state of the inner city, um, lack of economic opportunity, rundown infrastructure, uh, that's there in small town America, say, drive down to a small town in, in South Georgia, in middle Georgia, where there's there's no downtown. Uh, you have out migration, no in migration. Rural hospitals are closing. 
Um, grocery stores are closing down. The same problems that inner city communities face. How much of that is a symptom of what you talked about where you have the wealthy and then you have low wage, no wage earners? Is, is that a symptom of the same problem, do you think? I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe if we could answer that, we've... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I know the urban issue is not the lack of demand for services. Uh, it's, it's the facilities aren't there. I've, I've, I've come across people saying that we have no restaurants short of uh, south of I-20. There's no nice restaurants you can go to. Well, they're not there, I guess, because they're not economically viable. I, 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 I have no idea. I guess somebody's going to have to open one and suffer the losses for a while until it gets to where it's accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, I mean, you've got, I think public policy uh, has failed us in, 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 those, in those communities. I think public po policy has failed us. I don't think the people in the U.S. Senate, I don't think the representatives, wherever they are, I think you look at, I, I, I don't think they've spent enough time walking the aisle. <laughs> Take Sam Walton again, walking the aisle, understanding what's the dynamics there. I, I mean, if I've got a blight area and, and nobody's there, then, then give them free taxes. No, no property taxes for 10 years. No income tax, you pay, don't pay any income tax for 10 years. Move here, open a store, do something. I mean, f find a way to get, if you incentivize people, they, they, I mean, they're gonna follow the incentive. Everybody follows their incentive. Look and my the, incentive is that I gotta be out of here in about five minutes. <laughs> well, on, on that note, t tell me about your, your, your current you know, business initiatives, your charitable initiatives. I know, I know you and your wife, Jenny, do a lot uh, here in the community. What, do you, what are you guys uh, busying yourselves with these days? I have, a, I, I, there's, there's several things that I'm proud of. And one is that I started a uh, golf tournament for inner city kids uh, under the YMCA. Uh, it's called the YCEO and it's raised five and a half million dollar endowment. It's now 33 years going. It's the most expensive golf tournament in Georgia. You got to pay six grand oh. to to play a team of a team of two people. Oh. <laughs> uh, we, uh, Jenny started this Fix Georgia Pets, which is a spay and neuter. Mm -hmm. They raise about a half a million a year to help spay and neuter dogs and cats around the state. Uh, I was able to get past a, uh, a special tag for spay and neuters, so we have a Georgia Pet Foundation. I, did, I didn't know you were, you were involved in that. It's called the Georgia Pet Foundation, uh, and I'm the, I'm the president. When, when, when uh, the legislation was passed, they asked if I'd head it up initially, and so, and so we've, we've got that underway. Uh, I tell you, it's really, it's wonderful to, uh, I, I was heavily involved with United Way, uh, not today as much as I was back in the mid to late 90s and early 2000s. Um, headed up the major donors group here for United Way and then nationally headed up. So, so United Way has been a big part of my, my, uh, my past. I, I really am probably, keen as much as anything on helping things get organized so that they can be, they can be multiplied and they can. So we had 140 people giving 10 grand a year to United Way here and they asked me to head it up and over a couple of different times, probably seven or eight years in total, we got it to a thousand. So a thousand people that give 10 grand a year, I mean, that's, that's in my math, Florida State math, that's almost $10 million, right? <laughs> so, so it's really, I mean, I feel very fortunate, Jenny and I both do, that we have a, the wherewithal and uh, the health, uh, healthy enough to still be able to get involved with those sorts of things. And, and I've got a son that is just an avid, avid graduate, uh, 
of University of Georgia. So he's, Good man. He's watching your games every weekend, and he's calling me, telling me to turn on the TV. <laughs> well, Mr. Milner, uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you, have you here for the, the Two-Party Georgia Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Thank you very much, sir.